So even though you can think of it as completely equivalent, it's exactly equivalent, where, whereas this is my start point of my curve and it's zero. And that's the end point of my curve and that's one, right? All I'm saying is that is what I'll be referring to and you will also find it in the literature as a normalized parameter. Normalized means it doesn't matter what the construction of the curve requires in terms of parameter at the start and parameter at the end, right? But normalized means that no matter what it is, I'm going to treat start at zero and one as end. And I think that's pretty simple, but it at least it allows me to start talking about dimensions in a in a way that doesn't necessarily refer to the x y z dimension, right? That we have as a Cartesian coordinates um, in right. Now the cool thing, what can you do with this t, right? Like what what can you do? Um, so again, before we jump into grasshopper, let's say I want to have like an unequal division of curves, right? And I want to, like as a pattern, think of these things as points on a line. Maybe those points came from a projection, maybe it came from some sort of construction, maybe they came numerically, I don't know. But what I do know, let's say, is that I want to apply those that pattern to both that curve, but also to that curve. And let's say I want to apply it to 1,000 curves, right? Um, I hope in your mind, without necessarily doing the math, you start to see how this association can happen, right? Because the point is then translated into a number and then that number can be applied to anything. So I can select these points and type the command flow. The flow will ask me for a base curve and it has a series of options here. I'll show you this option is important stretch in a second. I can click on this as a base curve and I can click on this as a target curve. What Rhino did, if I didn't, it had stretch no, what Rhino did is it transferred lengths, right? So the length along this curve and the length along this line is the same. Let me undo. If I select the same pattern, type flow and have stretch, yes, from here to there, and again from here to there, right? Now, effectively, Rhino normalized all of those parameters, zero and one, right? And you can quickly see how that pattern was transferred. Now, I'm showing you this, not because it's useful, like how many times you're going to have a point pattern that you have to do, like never. But I'm showing you this because it's easier to follow what the math does. And at some point, we're going to lose track what the math does, right? Um, so it's good to remember how this thing happens. It's not magic. Um, the beautiful thing about flow <laughs> is that it doesn't care if the pattern is on the curve, which you might find, if you've never done it, you might find confusing. I can type flow and you'll see that Rhino will bend the space around the curve in a similar ways that I was bending the cage edit before, right? Like I can use curve as a deformer of space and any object around it in a very precise kind of mathematical manner. Point, how many dimensions by itself? Let's say if the whole world was one point, how many dimensions would that world have? Maybe one time, no? If it's zero, zero. okay. If it's only one point, right? Like before the Big Bang, location made no sense. All locations were in the same spot. So you don't even need a number to explain location. It's there, it's zero, right? In fact, any one dimensional object in order to get the first notion of one dimensional object is you take a point you extrude it along some direction right that direction could be straight could be curved could be circle could be uh, anything you want but ultimately you take a point you extrude it you have a one dimensional object you do this again right you take a line you take a curve you take a circle you quote extrude it again along another path you get a two dimensional object and I'm just going to say this now for the record. We are out of dimensions, right? I'm working on a two dimensional screen. There is no three dimension. There is no third dimension here. No. Everything else from now on is going to be a projection on your screen. 
it might be like Kasa said, the reason why we open up Rhino and we treat it as if it has a three dimensional space is because the programmers behind Rhino made it seamless for us to move the mouse and feel like we're moving in a three dimensional space. There is no three dimensional space here. There's a bunch of lists with a bunch of numbers that are being constantly projected through perspectival projection onto your screen. So just from the get go, I'm going to say, if I forget the third dimension here, if I want to make a cube, uh, what I'm going to do in order to draw a cube, and that's what we tell five year olds, right, to do is pick a random vector and, and make a copy of the square, connect the corners, right? Basically, extrude along one more direction. The point here is this projection of a cube and in 2D, right? And let's say, sorry, let me take my grid snap off. Um, and this projection, oh, come on. This projection of a cube here, this way, whatever, get rid of these guys. You will all agree that for all intents and purposes, these two objects could be the same cube or a different cube. We don't know, right? And the other thing that I want to mention here is that both of these drawings are equally true to the cube. There's not one that is truer than the other. They're just both shadows of the same object, right? So what did we do here in order to add another dimension? We picked a random vector. So based on the vector that we chose as a point of view, right? Like this is the point of view that I'm looking at this thing. This is the type of isometric that I want to build. Well, every time I pick a vector, I can make a different shadow of the cube. Now, it always helps to take this thing one dimension down. When I'm starting to think about four dimensional geometry, it's always easier to think of it between 3D and 2D and extrapolate uh, a specific relationship into higher dimensions. So, I guess very quickly here, what I'll try to convince you is that in a simple way, if you want to draw a hypercube, all you need to do is basically pick pick a dimension, pick a pick a dire direction and an orientation, right? And effectively connect the corners. Now, of course, I don't have enough time right now to explain to you all the different aspects of what a hypercube is. Um, the one thing that you might find a little bit interesting or at least intriguing so that you can look a little bit further, right? Is that this object is actually eight cubes, not two, right? The way that this thing kind of works out is, think of it again as a, what, what is the relationship between a rectangle and a uh, cube, right? So when we start from a rectangle, we have four edges, each one of which becomes a face, right? So we started with four edges and we got four faces, right? Plus the cap and the opening that we started with. All in all, six faces is the cube, right? So when we go from 3D to 4D, I start with six faces. Each one of those six faces is going to become a cube. So I have six cubes plus the original one in the middle, seven, plus the wrapping one around it, eight. And that's why this thing is called an eight cell. It's, it's eight spaces in a sense wrapped again, uh, against each other.